The archaeological research facility is located in Huichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Ohlone people and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native Americans and Indigenous peoples by our actions, not just our words. Today, our speakers include Dr. Trimble Havel, Emanuele Guglielmini, Anna Nielsen, Sandra Osoguera, Sotomayor. I won't read you the title, but I find it interesting in the discussion of their uh, on the on the website, um, kind of coming back into the world after uh, you know as the pandemic eased up a bit. Um, their goals for this collective project for the East Asian Archaeology Lab were to collect archaeological data, understanding continuity and change in landscape practices in the mountainous regions of Japan, to resume PEB research that was started before the pandemic, and to start discussions with Japanese scholars and local stakeholders to develop inter- and transdisciplinary approaches. So you have a group of people here having lots of conversations that are going to be able to squeeze in. Let's welcome them to the end. Thank you, John, and thank you, everybody. And as John said, um, this is a report of our summer activities after two and a half years of not being able to do pretty much no, no research in Japan. None of the uh, non-Japanese citizens were able to go to Japan pretty much unless you are a permanent resident. And even though I was able to go to Japan, pretty much I couldn't do any research. Rural parts of Japan, people are so scared of COVID and uh, people didn't welcome people from Tokyo or big cities, not to say from America. So um, this summer, um, things were getting a little bit um, less uh, tight. And we decided this is a summer, we're gonna go to Japan. We can do whatever we can. And let me just see. It's not... So um, today's talk is not about theory, but I want you to uh, think about what I said in my previous bad lunch uh, when I talked about uh, managing the forest with a focus on fire. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on historical ecology, um, human impacts on the biosphere is very important to understand that landscape, so vegetation, plant succession, and fire, and traditional ecological knowledge and materiality multiple temporal and spatial scales. From there, archaeology can really do the study of the long degree. And by working with agroecologists, we can start thinking about landscape, um, cultural landscape, but tied to the multiple equilibria of uh, um, ecosystems. And materiality, I want to tell a um, couple of examples that um, there's a big debate to what extent we see continuity from the Jomon period to the present. And ideologically speaking, I'm not uh, one of those who are using Jomon to push back the origins of the Japanese to the older period. There are uh, people who take that stance. I'm not one of them. But that said, I see a lot of continuity in landscape practice and material culture. I'm going to pass around two pieces. This is lacquerware um, made of poison oak. I have a couple of slides related to that. Um, you won't get uh, um, allergic uh, because it's completely dry, but this technique goes back to the Jomon period. Uh, this is a piece of fabric uh, made by an Ainu uh, weaver uh, made of um, tree bark. And this technique, again, uh, I'm sure goes back quite old. The color part is more artistic contemporary part, but the technique itself goes back. And that kind of materiality, uh, when you think of how long it takes to get the materials, 
it's not just a weaving technique or a naka or a production technique. It's really, you are so closely tied to local environment. If you're interested in the theory part, please uh, visit the University of Cambridge YouTube site where I have a full talk about how we think of um, Japanese archaeology from a perspective of the intersection of historical ecology, agroecology, and uh, uh, <clears throat> um, resilience theory. So um, for my research, I'm very interested in uh, the long-term change in, uh, and continuity and change in food practice. And I said in my previous presentation that the shift um, with a focus on starchy plant food as staple food at around 7,000 years ago, that was a major, major change. And uh, in a way, I think that was more important than the adoption of agriculture. And I think um, on Monday's Enrico Krima's talk, you guys got some sense of different uh, angles that what kind of data are available. And um, as I said previously, Japan, um, two thirds of the country is covered by the forest, three quarters of the land is hilly and mountainous. So we are getting more and more interested in the uh, historical and uh, um, ethnographic examples of uh, mountainous people's food ways, life ways, what kind of continuities can we see? Um, and that includes the use of fire, not only for Sweden agriculture, but to clear the land, um, the use of nuts, including acorns and buckeyes, the lacquer um, poison oak tree sap to produce the lacquer ware that I'm just circulating, and the use of wild plants such as uh, warabi bracken. So with this in mind, uh, I went to Japan this summer and uh, I was so happy that three of my students were able to join me or I join one of them um, as they do their research in Japan. We had, um, at least for me, there were three goals that one is to do archival research and museum trips to collect archeological data, to understand continuity and change in landscape practice in the mountainous regions of Japan. Second part is the laboratory work at the Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Properties to resume paleoethnobotanical research that we started before the pandemic and to make free trips with Japanese agroecologists and scholars in other fields to visit mountainous areas of Japan to discuss the potential of inter and transdisciplinary approaches. So um, just to do the archaeology part, um, this is a sample that we put aside for a while and we are now coming back. This is the Sanai Maruyama number nine site excavated by the prefectural archaeologists. And uh, we got some samples. Um, we got data of pollen, phytoris, diatom analysis and radiocarbon 14 dates. Uh, we did a rough sorting of nutshells um, and uh, we haven't had a chance to touch on the seed assemblage part. So um, this summer, we went to the NARA uh, <clears throat> National Cultural Properties Research Institute, and we spent about a week to um, resume where we are at. Uh, it's, it, it will take a while. Uh, it's been a while we put this project aside. But um, the samples are all waterlogged. Uh, the conditions, as you can see, there are a couple of buckeye layers. There are really dark bands are the buckeye layers. This may actually push back the origins of Bakai use um, a little bit earlier than um, previously Japanese archaeologists were discussing. And that matches with um, Enrico's yesterday's talk of the um, um, decline in the number of sites um, at around that time. Previously, people said that the use of Bakai started after the decline, but it may actually go back. Um, we also had a chance to do to join a workshop, and here's Anna, Sandra, and cousin Ishihara, who was visiting us uh, until last summer. They all did presentations, and we had really uh, productive discussions with Japanese archaeologists. Another thing that we did in terms of archaeology is to go back to the Goshono site that we worked um, in 2019, we took soil samples, we did finish sorting the samples, we got AMS dates, and that was actually a bit of a surprise that the site we were um, 
our understanding was the site is a middle German site at around 4,500 calibrated BP, but our dates came back much earlier, um, middle of the um, early German, um, around 5,800 years ago. So we, I went back, I went to the site twice. First, I told them this is a result, three out of the four AMS dates came back this way. What do you think? And they said that, oh no, that must be some kind of sample mix up. Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, we went back. They said that actually they did go through all the excavated potsherds and they did find a lot more early German potsherds than they initially um, thought of. So now actually, it was actually really good that our results actually made um, um, contribution to the understanding of the site. And for us, it's great because um, we really want to work on the Gosono site as an example of mountainous part of German settlement. But the time span that we initially thought um, <clears throat> was uh, too short. But now it looks like we actually do have a longer time span. So um, we are hoping to go back. And now, Sandra, and I need to write this up. Um, so Iwate is also very rich with uh, ethno-historical record. And uh, here's one of the places that this is right, um, the town next to Goshono, where um, after several visits, I was finally able to um, be allowed to do laka sub-collecting. The left of side is me. Um, the, as you can see, um, that's pretty much what you can get from one scratch of a uh, lacquer um, sub-collecting. So imagine how long it takes to produce that red ball that I just circulated. But this time, we really looked at the landscape. Um, these are uh, transplanted uh, laka tree, uh, <clears throat> Um, like five-year laka tree um, seedling. And uh, in terms of thinking about Jomon plant management, we are really wondering laka tree were also managed in that way. That's one of the proposals of Sanai Mariyama archaeologists. And looking at the vegetation, uh, even though the backside is a cedar tree that are planted very recently, there are still um, deciduous forests left around there from which we can really start thinking about the uh, <clears throat> continuity in, uh, for, in the forest composition in the area. Very quickly, we also visited um, another part of Iwate Prefecture where um, we were able to visit um, former slash and burn agriculture area. Um, and uh, on the right side is a photo from right after the Second World wall on the left side is the other side of um, the area where people were burning. And one side is burning for the field and the other side is for Sweden agriculture. And there are written records of um, how that was practiced. This is one of the areas. We have huge amount of Sweden agriculture literature. And uh, we started to learn how the crop cycling, um, crop cycles and landscape management are related. Um, I don't want to take up too much of my students' time, so I'm going to go through very quickly. Um, another place we visited um, is further um, um, in the mountainous area, Aka in Iwate, where we were able to uh, see um, photos of uh, types of radish, um, red daikon, which are pickled that way. After three years, it's like this. Uh, the important part is not, it's not only traditional food, but it's really part of the crop cycle of uh, Sweden agriculture. And even though they stopped burning, they still maintain the types of crops that were related to the practice. Uh, the top one is, uh, top right is uh, chestnut dumpling, and the left bottom is acorn dumpling that local um, in owner um, served us uh, after talking to her for a while. She first showed that and uh, said that, well, if you guys have more time, I could also give you acorn dumplings. And we looked at her and said, really? We would love to taste that. <laughs> and uh, um, after 30 minutes, um, she gave it. And the top um, is that uh, grilled tofu, which was really the main part of protein sauce for the area. 
Um, we also visited uh, Shikoku. Um, this is part of the Higashi Ia Tokushima Prefecture, where um, another area that you see the tradition of Sweden agriculture until very recently. This is now designated as a Nishiawa steep slope land agricultural system, which is part of the um, global, globally important agricultural heritage system, GS. And uh, um, there again, they stopped burning, but part of the crop cycles are really um, still there. Uh, <clears throat> even in the vicinity of Tokyo, this is actually my uh, <clears throat> Kamakura Homes neighbor, neighborhood, you can still see that part of the, what we call the Satoyama landscape, the um, human impacted landscape, kind of commonly utilized area. It's, um, it's still, um, you can still see the um, remaining patterns. This is um, rice paddy field, but it's actually very small, that it's very narrow um, valley. And the rest of the area um, are used for cultivating various types of crops and uh, millet. So you can see that even in the Tokyo area, um, it's actually the hilly area all the way very close to the ocean. You can see that the re use of mountainous resource was very important. Okay, so... Um, with that, as an introduction, I have three students who want to present what they did this summer, which I think, uh, let me just see. Okay. So what I was really pleased this summer, I think before May, I felt, okay, I have three graduate students who are doing their own things. And uh, even though we talk a lot about historical ecology, um, it's their own project, my project um, is separate from them. And uh, I think traveling throughout the Japanese archipelago with Emanuele, Anna, and Sandra, I was really happy to see that we got so many things in common, that our research themes are so closely tied. And uh, I was especially happy to think you know, that none of them is working on Jomon hunter-gatherers of the um, mainland Honshu, and yet we got so many things in common. Mm -hmm. So first, I believe Emanuele is uh, giving his several minutes presentation on linking cuisine and the environment of on the island of Hokkaido. Okay. Okay. okay hi, everyone. So today I'll be talking about um, my preliminary fieldwork in Hokkaido and my research directions and how they have shifted somewhat after being able to visit Hokkaido this summer. So just to give you an idea where Hokkaido is located, it's the northernmost island of the Japanese archipelago and it's the homeland of the indigenous Ainu people. And first off, I wanna start talking a little bit broadly about cuisine and anthropology and why it is um, interesting to me, but also um, if, uh, whether it can be used as a tool to impact the larger context of human environment relationships. Uh, so I think that as archeologists strive to uh, understand changes in the, in the human past, uh, cuisine poses a fascinating paradox. We know that um, food uh, is uh, tightly linked to people's identity. Uh, and we know that food is not just fuel. It is a type of material culture that is highly symbolic, deeply ingrained, and persisting over time. We also know through studies of taste uh, that taste preference for food uh, is defined very early on in life. And that positive experiences such as calories, sweet taste, mood elevation, and social reward paired with the food make the food light whereas negative experiences make it disliked. And so the question arises, if foodways are so stable, deeply ingrained, and food is so closely tied to identity, how is change possible in the first place? But we know that change does happen. We know this from the archeological and from the ethnographic record. Uh, and so I'm interested in understanding what factors are capable of causing foodways to change. 
uh, and linking it back to human environment relationships, I wonder whether shifting dynamics in the interaction between people and the environment can act as a driving factor for the changes in cuisine that we observe archaeologically. And, and the photos I just have, um, uh, two food items, one from the Jomon period, which is called a Jomon hamburger. It's a mix of meat and plants. Uh, and the other from the Ainu period, much later on, which is a, a mix of fiber and starch from lily bulbs. Uh, so in terms of um, pursuing this research, um, I want to draw on uh, two main theoretical frameworks, uh, historical ecology and resilience theory. In terms of historical ecology as a framework, it rests on a series of postulates, and I'd like to draw attention to two of them in particular. Uh, so the first one about how human environment relationships develop through mutual interaction between humans and other species. Uh, so I can assume that people in Hokkaido were always affecting the environment to a degree because the interaction is mutual. So there's no such thing as pristine um, nature. And the other um, postulate uh, on how human disturbance of the environment can have both positive as well as negative effects. Uh, so I can assume that their practices uh, for environmental management were sometimes successful and other times damaging to species diversity. And then lastly, in terms of theory, um, I'm interested in resilient theory because of its focus on change uh, as a representative state of social ecological system, systems, uh, which are continuously transient. Um, and in addition, resilience theorists believe that flexibility rather than stasis promotes system resilience or the capacity to adapt to change. So if this is true, I can assume that lack of flexibility would lead to problems in the long run in terms of resource extraction. So tying food back into the picture, um, I wonder uh, how do periods of high food system resilience that are characterized by diversity and flexibility in resource extraction practices versus periods of over specialization affect cuisine, but also is it possible to correlate instances of loss of resilience with changes in cuisine? And can some of the changes in cuisine that we see archaeologically be explained through episodes of change in environmental management practices? Uh, so these things I was thinking about before going to Hokkaido, and then as I was able to visit this summer, some of my ideas, um, more, the more practical sides of the research have shift, shifted somewhat. Uh, so to start it, to start with my data set, uh, I set out wanting to explore changes in food through the lens of plant mapper remains. And Hokkaido is well known, uh, even within Japan, for having one of the older uh, paleobotanical traditions in the country. Uh, and so there is an abundance of uh, plant macro remain data in Hokkaido, in the sense that many sites have been sampled. Um, but once I went there, I realized that the quantity of ethnobotanical data for macro remains there uh, is not necessarily equivalent to its quality always. Um, so what I mean by that is that although many sites have been sampled, a lot of the sites were sampled only uh, where there were burnt soil features and in the hearts. And so while the situation is slightly different for the larger sites, uh, this problem of judgmental sampling still makes um, comparison across sites uh, somewhat more difficult than I was hoping for. Uh, so going forward, um, because of Kaido has a very rich settlement data record, but also very rich uh, heritage artifact collections, um, I, I'm thinking of using a mix of macro remains as well as starch analysis from this heritage um, uh, artifact collections uh, to analyze changes in food over time. And the plant record for Hokkaido, um, of wild plants specifically, is uh, quite rich in plants that are likely to leave uh, starch remains. Um, and here I have a photo of a food item that we were served uh, in Hokkaido, uh, a traditional Ainu dessert made of millet and um, immer cork tree berries. And then lastly, another aspect that has shifted following my visit to Hokkaido is my time period focus. So while I began wanting to look at changes over time, uh, focusing on the Jomon hunter-gatherers, uh, after going to Hokkaido, it became apparent that the Japanese uh, periodization of archaeology has had the effect of alienating uh, indigenous Ainu people from their archaeological heritage. Uh, and I have heard Ainu state, some Ainu stakeholders voicing their concerns on how uh, Jomon data uh, have been interpreted without any input from indigenous people, uh, and that there is a need to highlight more the continuity uh, between the Jomon period and the Ainu indigenous people today as well. In addition to that, I also visited the Upopoe uh, new National Ainu Museum that was opened in 2020, and I have some photos of that here. 
And I notice uh, the lack of material culture from any period prior to the Ainu period. Uh, and so noticing these patterns, I, I believe that um, if I am to conduct a study of who changes over time in 2022 in Hokkaido, there is a need to pay attention to the complicated dynamics between uh, academia and Ainu stakeholders. Um, and there is scope for conducting a uh, research that is not uh, specifically focused only on the Jomon period, but is um, longer in time scope through the focus of the long durée in a way that can highlight both continuity and diversity between the prehistoric period and today's indigenous peoples in Hokkaido. Uh, that said, uh, through this kind of study, I don't wish to repeat the mistakes of uh, past researchers who have uh, labeled Ainu people as uh, Stone Age people and made all sorts of careless connections between the two. Uh, but I think uh, this can be done in a way that um, can create a more inclusive narrative. And that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emanuele. And now we are moving on to Anna's presentation. It should be labeled as Nielsen Diagnostic. Perfect. Hello, everyone. Um, my talk is not nearly as well organized as anything that Junko or Manuela just had to say, so please bear with me. And it's somewhat characteristic of the, I guess, slightly disorganized time I had getting to Japan over the last two and a half years. As Junko mentioned, the country was very closed to researchers for a while. Um, and so it was actually quite sudden when I found out that I was able to go and was able to go to Okayama University as a visiting researcher for two months, which was absolutely fantastic. I'm so grateful I was able to go. And and I can honestly say there were no negative experiences whatsoever over the two months that I was there. It's just so wonderful to be there. Um, I'm going to talk very generally about some landscape trends that I saw in Okayama because that's what I was able to look at. This is one of the, so I work in the Kofun period and I look at Kofun period subsistence. The Kofun period very briefly is um, Japan's state formation period. It's characterized by mounded tombs and all sorts of new technologies that were coming into the Japanese archipelago. And this is one of the stone chamber tombs on the mountain right behind where I was living. There were dozens of them. There were, dozens, there were hundreds of Kofun period sites and tombs all around the area of Okayama. It's a very archeologically rich area and a very overlooked and understudied area in a lot of ways. And so I just put this picture here to characterize the density of archeological data that's available all of archaeological sites, and then there's quite a lot of data available, and then few studies in some ways. The area has been understudied, as I said. Like I said, I was able to go to Okayama University to work there, and I'm very grateful for all of the support that I received while working in um, the lab of um, Jun Mitsumoto, who is actually going to be a professor from Okayama University, is going to be coming here to Berkeley as a visiting researcher in the next two weeks, and he'll be here for the next six months. So if you get the chance to speak to him, he studies gender archaeology of the Kofun period, and he's also an expert in remote sensing um, methods. Um, that's one aspect of archaeology that Okayama University is particularly strong in. And so the conversations I was able to have with people in the lab, and while I wasn't able to participate in any of the field work because I was there exactly during the Japanese summer break for the universities, I was still able to get a very good idea of what people were doing and set the groundwork of being able to go back soon. And so I was also able to, like Juka mentioned, I won't linger on this too long, I was able to travel with her to the village of Higashiya, which is deep in the mountains of Tokushima. And it we were examining landscapes and landscape practice over time. So here's, you can see, here's Junko, there's Sandra in the background. There's um, Professor Hitaka is one of the um, agroecologists at um, Ehime University. And then we have, I just picked a couple 
this picture is very characteristic of the extremely steep landscapes that you have in this area. That's why people were so reliant on slash and burn farming to be able to clear their fields to grow grains besides rice. There really was no way to practice any sort of rice agriculture. And um, this is just one of the bridges made using traditional techniques of cutting katsura vines that people needed these bridges to cross these very steep and narrow gorges to be able to get around. Anyway, I... It was, oh, it was very scary, by the way. I think I'm getting too old that I got scared. <laughs> I should have put a video in. There were steel cables inside the bridge. It wasn't made fully traditionally because in the past it would have just been those vines and nothing else holding you up. Um, but the time we were able to spend there, for one, it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And and two, it was, I'm so glad that Junko invited me and that I was able to come. But also the fact that even though if some of you have been able to attend over the last couple of days, either of the talks held by Enrico Crema, where he was talking a lot about rice agriculture, especially on Monday's talk, he was talking about rice agriculture in Japan. And he did mention, well, there was a big focus on when was the beginning of rice agriculture because rice is so connected to Japanese identity today. It is likely that in the past, up until probably the Meiji period up until the last couple of centuries, rice did not constitute the staple food of many people or even of most people in the Japanese archipelago. Plenty of other crops, millet, wheat, buckwheat, mountain vegetables, plenty of other foods were staple foods that people relied on. For many people in the Japanese archipelago, rice was a food, an elite food that they were only able to access a few times a year, perhaps. And so in a place like this where rice simply couldn't be grown, of course, they would consume rice imported from elsewhere once in a while, but they were reliant on the crops that they could grow in this particular area. And I want, well, I'm going to sidetrack really quick. As many of you know, a personal interest of mine is horses in the Kofun period. And I was able to do a lot of work with horses this time around in Okayama. I happen to live about five minutes from the university stables. So I went there actually most mornings to work and help the dressage team prepare. And I was able to observe in several cases well, I was able to observe four different farriers working because I'm a farrier, I'm a horseshoer as well, and I'm very interested in equine hoof care in the past. This here, I was able to visit, and Japan has um, a number of extremely endangered native breeds on the archipelago. This is the Noma horse, of which there are currently 47 horses left in this breed. They're likely to go extinct in the next 20 years, but these are the descendants of horses that were used historically, horses that were ridden by samurai, horses that were used in agricultural work. And they, mo many of these breeds were either critically endangered or went extinct entirely prior to World War II. Several people have tried to preserve eight breeds that are left, and I was able to go to the only facility that's still breeding and protecting these normal horses. I was also able to go to a special exhibit they were having in Izumo in talking about um, horse riding in the past. They are using here a lot of Haniwa, a lot of ceramic kind of statuettes that were placed on Kofun tombs during the Kofun period that depict saddles and tack that elite people would have used when riding horses. This is one of the university horses who likes to be scratched in a particular spot. I found the right spot. So also this here is a Dosanko horse, another native breed of horse that I saw in the historical village of Hokkaido. And his handler is very kindly showing me the horse's feet and how they shoe the horse. This is one of the university farriers actually at Hokkaido University, not Okayama trimming the horse's hooves. They they use traditional tools, very similar to the tools that Junko would have used in um, collecting lacquer sap to make um, the, that urushi bowl that she passed around. They use a very similar type of kama, but this is the one that's specifically designed for cutting horse hooves. I was actually given a couple of them, which is completely fantastic because you can only buy these in a couple specialty stores in Japan, and then you will not find them anywhere else in the world because Japan is the only place that cuts horse hooves with these tools and they've probably been using these tools for hundreds of years if not longer 
but no one has ever really studied this, so they don't know. So a lot of you know that this is my private personal interest. In the future, I would really like to create a project that examines equestrianism in the Kofun period, because there are plenty of archaeologists who are studying the saddles and tack of the Kofun period. I don't believe there are really any archaeologists in Japan who have any experience with riding horses, because it's just a very unusual thing. It, there are many archaeologists who look at this tack, but have, don't have experience with handling horses or how tack would fit on a horse. No, no shade to the archaeologist. It's just riding horses and interacting regularly with horses is not a normal thing in Japan. They don't have very many horses outside of the horse racing industry. There are almost no horses that you'll see in the countryside. And so because of this dearth of, I would say, practical knowledge and how horses are used, because um, the historical period use of horses in agriculture is just a distant memory to most people. I believe there's kind of a gap in there that, um, especially if there's experimental archeology span programs that are using these native horses, which are the closest thing, again, they're descendants of historical horses. They're the closest we have to Japanese horses in the past. It could also be very helpful in preservation of native horse breeds. Back to the environment of Okayama really quickly. Um, and this here is just, these are several hundred year old um, kiln sites. I was, the area where I was living is very famous for this type of pottery called bizenware. And I went back many times actually to the place, um, to the town where they're producing all of this bizenware, to the town of Bizen, and made quite a few friends with people there who are producing bizenware. I was able to make some myself. I was able to, I was given tours of several kilns. In this case, um, because his parents were minding the store, this particular family who I visited several times sent their 10 year old son to give um, me and my friend a tour of the kiln and this this boy had so much environmental knowledge he was I, I couldn't believe one the level of knowledge he had about the environment in which he was living and the detailed knowledge he had at age 10 of how everything in the kiln works his explanations sounded to me like an archaeologist talking about the way that kilns work. It was really quite amazing. And so there are a lot of people living in Okayama because of the mountainous landscape um, and the I guess the more rural character of Okayama in some ways, who are very aware of the local landscape that they live in and how important it is to their livelihood. Okayama is as the name suggests, it's written with the characters for hill and mountain. It's a very mountainous area. It doesn't have very many flat places. Rice is grown in the flats here is one of the rice fields being filled with water. This was in early June, but it ha also has a very unique climate compared to many other parts of Japan. Japan, as you may know, is very hot, very wet. They have monsoons and floods and typhoons. Um, Okayama actually receives a lot less rain than other parts of Japan. Everyone was always telling me that it's called Hare no Kuni, like the sunny country. It has the highest number of sunny days a year of anywhere in Japan. And its climate is often compared more to a Mediterranean climate. They grow a lot of citrus fruits. They grow peaches. My friend Mika took me to her family's grape farm. They're the um, largest grape producing area of anywhere in Japan because of that aforementioned Mediterranean climate. Yet at the same time, they still experience severe natural disasters related to water, related to anything else. In 2018, there was severe flooding, um, which shocked a lot of people in Okayama because they weren't used to that kind of heavy rain and flooding. They hadn't, a lot of people hadn't thought that this could happen. I'd ask people about it and they'd pull out their phones and scroll back to 2018 and they'd show me pictures. This was the flooding outside my house. This was the flooding outside my station. This is how bad it was. This here is on top of the one of the Kofun tombs. This is the fourth largest keyhole shaped Kofun tomb in the Japanese archipelago is located in Okayama. Actually, one of the stables that I volunteered at on Saturdays is right on the other. It's tucked right up against the Kofun itself. It's right on the other side of the tomb. You can see here, there was a lot of damage and flooding to the tomb itself in 2018. It caused a landslide on the side of the tomb. And so anyway, these unique characteristics of Okayama, since I'm interested in um, subsistence patterns in the past, how people in the Kofun period, what were they actually eating? Was it in fact rice? We have this Kofun center, we have elite people were building large numbers of tombs, both huge monumental um, mounded tombs, and then also those smaller stone chamber tombs that still belong to elites. 
they were building these all over the place. What was their subsistence pattern like? Who was eating rice? What was being grown? It's my suspicion that there was not enough flat land to produce enough rice to feed everyone, that people were reliant on other forms of subsistence, most likely growing grains, millet, and buckwheat in the hills. But I'm trying to put together a project that will examine the proportion of what kinds of grains were being grown. I'm sorry, I've gone way over time. Okay. Um, but I think, uh, um, as you can see, when Anna came to work with me, she said she wants to work on the cocoa film. I was thinking, another person who wants to work on non-Jomo. <laughs> and it turned out that what she wants to do is very much relevant to what I'm interested in, the transition from uh, acorn to millet to um, rice or not. So we now share so many things in common. We talk a lot, and when we look at the landscape, um, I'm really happy that we share a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I think we are kind of running out of time. We do have actually Sandra's video. Um, I know many of you may have to leave, uh, but um, those of you who can stay, uh, please be here for nine more minutes with us. And if not, um, take a look at it on the web later. But let me just... Okay. So here's another student who's not working on Japan. For those of you who Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Um, okay. So let's see. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to put the microphone. And I am a PhD candidate here at UC Berkeley. Um, unfortunately, I am teaching a discussion section exactly at the same time as this round back, and that is a reason that I cannot be physically there with you. However, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this presentation alongside Junko and my other colleagues, Anna and Emanuele. So as Junko stated at the beginning of this presentation, I had the opportunity to return to Japan after three years, sponsored by the Institute for International Studies here at UC Berkeley and the Sumimoto Foundation via the Research Institute for Humans and Nature in Kyoto, Japan. Um, during my two weeks in Japan, I spent time at the Nara National Research Institute for Cultural Property, working on paleo-novotonical remains from Sanai Maruyama Number no. 9, and strengthening a working relationship between the Institute and UC Berkeley. Um, after we were done with this work, uh, Junko and I returned to Goshono Archaeological Site, a prehistoric Gemon site where the paleo-novotanical remains we had been working on for the past three years were from. This return was an essential stop during our time in Japan because we had committed ourselves to go back and discuss the results from our research. And we were very glad to see that the director of the museum and the site was very pleased with what we follow, what we found. Um, Sorry. Following the laboratory work in Nara Research Institute and before visiting Goshono, I had the opportunity to join Junko and a team of multidisciplinary scholars on a research trip through rural Japan focused on the regions of Shikoku and Iwate to begin preliminary research on the analysis of mountainous agricultural landscapes. The main objectives of our visit were to one, um, to identify changes and continuities in the landscape, and two, learn about the traditional ecological knowledge that has been maintained through the collective memory of these regions. 
And as we move deeper into the mountainous and isolated regions of Japan, I cannot help but feel a familiarity and recognize the similarities in the landscape and the culture between Japan and my dissertation area of study, which is the northern highlands of Oaxaca, Mexico, Mexico, also known as La Sierra Norte. And La Sierra Norte de Oaxaca, similar to Japan, is a mountainous region isolated from mainstream culture where people still practice traditional agriculture for self-subsistence, like, and like rural Japan today, um, the indigenous people of Oaxaca face the challenge of an aging population that is the one that maintains landscapes and practices agriculture. Both rural Japan and Oaxaca risk losing knowledge, traditions, and the capacity of self-subsistence as younger generations in the mountains migrate to bigger cities. Um, so moving into the Mexico part of my presentation, I had the opportunity this summer to spend one month in Oaxaca thanks to the Stanley Brandis Fellowship for Ethnographic Research. And I arrived to the Northern Highlands in early August and traveled between three indigenous villages during my time there. These villages were Villa Tala de Castro, San Pablo Nexicho, and San Juan Lubina. The objective of my research trip there was to identify villages that, one, maintain intimate connection to their land through their agricultural knowledge and practice, two, places where archeological features were present in the landscape, and three, where people were interested in collaborating and collaboratively being part of the project that I am beginning. And I found, I found these features in these three places that I'm talking to you about today. So other findings that I had during my time in the Northern Highlands is that these communities have a complex relationship with their indigenous identity. And while they'll still maintain usos y costumbres, which is their traditional ways, they often want to highlight their Western features to others. And those features are very assimilated as well as who they are. So this is a Catholic church and there, uh, there is a lot of syncretism between the indigenous traditions and the Spanish tradition that now predominates in Mexico. Um, then I also found that each village has a different relationship with its land and its agricultural practices. Uh, these three villages each have different, um, yeah, different natural resources and also different practices. And although they all cultivate the same staples, which are beans, corn, and galites, um, each village also has different approaches to agriculture. So Villa Tala de Castro is known, is historically known for their coffee production. And it is now diversifying its practice to include fruit trees and also trying to step away from the use of chemical fertilizers to take on a more agroecological orientation. Um, San Juan Lubina, which is the smallest town that I, or village that I visited over in the summer, only has 500 inhabitants and they are mostly women and the elderly. This town is the one that reported the most amount of deaths during the pandemic. And from these three villages that I had the opportunity to spend time in, um, is the one that reported to have imported foods from Oaxaca City using money sent to them from the US, from migrants from the region in the US. Um, since there are mostly women and elderly in the town, um, it is very hard to continue to produce enough food for, for everyone. However, as you can see in these pictures, people still take very good care of their land and the men that are still in the town as well as the women and everyone that can work the land, it is actively participating in that. Um, also, there are so many features, archeological features, as we walk through through these landscapes and it's very interesting. Then the last town I visited was San Pedro Nexicho. And 
And although San Pedro shares the same staples, which are corn, beans, and calites, this town is also very interested, since very recently, in flower production, which is, which is a new economic activity for them. Well, lastly, what I wanted to share is that I will be working for my dissertation in these three communities. However, I will be paying um, particular attention or it will be specifically focused on San Pedro Nexicho and San Juan Luina, since these villages um, have archaeological evidence on, of them being the first places inhabited by the Zapotecs after the Montalban decline in 1080 or even earlier. And these two communities also had an early influx of Spanish conquerors after the Spanish crown arrived to Oaxaca in 1521. Um, so yeah, these pictures of San, Juan, San Pedro Nexicho, what I wanted to highlight is that these are pictures, these pictures are of archaeological terraces. These are terraces that have been in continue, continuously used through time since people first arrived to, to this area of the mountains. And the picture in the middle is the present, well, it is uh, something carved by the Zapotec used to build their temple and that was taken away or destroyed by the Spanish when they arrived. And it is now a piece in a Catholic church that is there in town. Well, Thank you for your attention, and I will let my colleagues continue, and yes, goodbye. Thank you, and Sandra Tiena. So, um, thank you very much for staying um, after 1 p.m., and uh, I guess uh, if anybody has questions, we can take one or two quick questions. Yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to that icon. And you said that yes. it's important crop related to yes. fire management of the landscape. How is it related to the fire management of the landscape? So basically, um, in terms of doing the Sweden agriculture, they always had crop rotations. The first year, um, depending on the timing of the burning, if it's the spring burning, then um, it could be here millet. But if it's a fall burning, um, it's uh, usually soba or something at the beginning. But you, they rotated crops, so you don't plant the same type of crops um, two years in a row. And uh, oftentimes what you see is part of the crop rotation is the daikon different types of local daikon, really local variety of daikon. Mm -hmm. And that um, daikon happens to be really in that particular region only. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, often what happens is when the slash and burn agriculture tradition um, gets stopped, then you lose that variety as well. But over there, people are trying really hard to keep the variety so that um, they can actually continue the food weight. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is that um, in Iwate, um, not only daikon, but people are also cultivating millet. It's coming back because it's actually fashionable. Um, if you go to the women's faculty club, you see different types of millet you know, in a fancy plate. Um, kind of same in Japan. Um, so Iwate Prefecture decided that will be uh, one of their major um, agricultural products and putting a lot of efforts um, to revive that tradition. Iwate also has the advantage that it's cool, so they can actually grow certain types of millet without pesticide. Whereas that um, the Shikoku, the southern part that Anna and I went together, that one was actually better known for millet cultivation in a way, but um, the prefecture is not putting a lot of eff um, effort. So even though it's a GIA site and it's a beautiful uh, you know, sloped um, agricultural landscape, but the landscape is much better in Shikoku, but they stopped pretty much growing millet. There's a tiny, teeny bit left for tourists and uh, some who are interested in the idea. But um, so you can really see that maintaining local variety, maintaining millet cultivation, maintaining the subsistence um, cycle, 
um, versus maintaining the food waste. These are two different things. So in Shikoku, people are importing millet from China or from Iwate because people are still eating it, but they are not growing it anymore. Mm -hmm. In Iwate, they're still doing it. And that's part of the reason that we feel that there's a lot of potential for collaboration between archaeologists and farmers and local residents because the tradition is still there. And uh, um, Japan, it, a lot of people think that it's like a big cities, Tokyo and uh, fancy old capital, Kyoto, but that's only a tiny, teeny portion of Japan. The big part of Japan is rural and how we're going to maintain and uh, revive um, traditional agricultural knowledge and uh, how we're going to work with local residents. Now, if everybody moves to Tokyo, then that that would be a disaster. And that's happening in Japan um, a lot faster than in uh, the United States mm -hmm. or many other countries. So that was a very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.